Well, good morning, everyone, to this online ministry of New Valley Reform History and Church. And we come together today and this, uh, over the internet, as we can't meet physically, but we come together over the internet to join together in worshiping our glorious God and glorious King. And we're going to begin by singing praise uh, to the Lord from Psalm number 45. Psalm number 45, the opening stanzas. And in this psalm, there is a great king that has been spoken about, a great king who has been adored, a great king who is victorious, a great king who stands for truth and for right and for justice. The fourth stanza, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, our great king, victorious, right in state, for meekness, truth and right. So Psalm number 45 is singing praise to God using these words. Let us sing praise. Oh, Let's come together and join together in prayer. Let's come to our King in prayer. Lord God, we do worship and adore you this day as the great and glorious King, the one who rules over all this earth, the one who is the sovereign Lord over all things. And we thank you, Lord, that you are not only a great and mighty King, but you're a holy King. So help us, O Lord, today to come with humility and reverence into your holy presence and seek to return to you uh, the praise and the glory that's due to your great name. We thank you, O Lord, that you are a gracious King. Uh, we thank you that you so loved the world that you sent your one and only Son into this world to save all who believe in him. We rejoice, O Lord, as well, particularly today, that you are a just and righteous King, that you are the judge of all the earth and that you do right. And one day, O God, the day in which you have appointed you will set all that is wrong right, and you will bring full justice into existence. In the meantime, O oh Lord, help us who live in this world that is often so full of injustice. Help us to look to you to be our stronghold and our help and our guide. And we uh, praise you, O oh Lord, that we can join together in this way uh, to praise you today. And we pray that as we do so, uh, you'll draw near to each one who is listening and that you'll minister to each of our needs out of the riches of your grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we do ask, O oh Lord, forgiveness for our many sins in and through the name of Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and man. And we ask it for his glory. Amen. Two readings from the Word of God. First of all, a very brief one. From the book of Revelation, book of Revelation, and chapter 15, and just the first four verses. Book of Revelation, and chapter 15, reading verses 1 to 4. And we'll see, especially as we read these words, 
the reference again to the justice of the great king, the justice of the great king. Revelation 15, 1 to 4. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So we end the reading there at verse 4, Revelation chapter 15. And we turn now to the main passage that we'll be meditating upon uh, today. And that's in Psalm number 9. Psalm number 9. Those who have been listening in in previous weeks will know that we've been thinking about uh, some of these early Psalms, beginning with Psalm 3. Last week we were at Psalm 8, which spoke to us of the glory of God that is set high above the heavens, the glory of God that can be seen all around us. And now we turn to Psalm number 9, which is also a Psalm of David. Let's hear again the word of God. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I'll be, I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. My enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you, for you have upheld my right and my cause. You have sat on your throne, judging righteously. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken the enemy. You have uprooted their cities, even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. For he who avenges blood remembers. He doesn't ignore, he doesn't ignore the cry of the afflicted. O Lord, see how my enemies persecute me. Have mercy and lift me from the gates of death, that I may declare your praises in the gates of the daughter of Zion, and there rejoice in your salvation. The nations have fallen into the pit they have dug. Their feet are caught in the net they have hidden. The Lord is known by his justice. The wicked are ensnared by the work of their hands. The wicked return to the grave all the nations that forget God. But the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted ever perish. Arise, O Lord, let not man triumph. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror, O Lord. Let the nations know they are but men. We draw ready really to close at verse 20 of this psalm. And the main theme is, praise the Lord for his justice. That's our theme today. Praise the Lord for his justice. I wonder uh, how often you think about praising God for his justice. No doubt you readily praise God for his amazing grace. For it is by grace you are saved. No doubt you often praise God for his immense love. For he so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to save all who believe in him. Most most probably you often praise God for his wisdom, acknowledging that his thoughts are far higher than your thoughts. So we often praise God for his grace, for his love and for his wisdom. But I suspect, I suspect that praising the Lord for his justice and righteousness is not something 
that we do that often, that we do as often as we should. Think about it for a moment. Is the justice of God something that you thankfully acknowledge in your prayers? Is his justice something that you delight to sing about? Well, when we look at the book of Psalms, which is God's inspired book of praise, the perfect pattern for praise, we find that over and over and over again, the justice of the Lord our God is acknowledged and it is adored. Maybe you could even set aside some time on this Lord's Day, flicking through the book of Psalms for a while, and you'll see for yourself that God's justice is a recurring theme. Over and over again it's mentioned. Uh, let me just mention one or two outstanding examples. Take for example Psalm 70, 97 and verse 2. 97 and verse 2. It declares that righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. In other words, the one who rules this universe is to be praised for his just rule. Or think about that Psalm 45, which we sang at the outset of this worship service. Do you recall how it referred to the glorious king? Stanza 3 extolled this glorious king with these words. Victorious, ride in state for meekness, truth and right. Or that could be translated for meekness, truth and justice and righteousness. And it's not only in the book of Psalms that we find God being acknowledged for his justice. Think of Abraham way back in the book of uh, Genesis as he was pleading for that wicked city of Sodom. And there we find Abraham confident that the judge of all the earth would do right, that he would judge justly. And if you turn to the very last book of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, Turn to Revelation chapter 15 and in the third verse, the following words were sung or being sung in praise to God. We read them a while ago. Here they are. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages, the eternal King. Just and true are his ways. But as we now turn back to have a closer look at Psalm 9, which is the subject of our devotion this morning you'll see the appreciation of the Lord's justice is at the very centre of it, at the very heart of it. It dominates it. Have a look, for example, at verse 4 of the psalm. Verse 4. You can see that David is there declaring of God, you sat on your throne judging justly. And then move on a little bit further. Have a look at verse 8. Verse 8 where David expresses his confidence that the Lord will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. There's a parallel there that mean the same thing, righteousness and justice in this instance. And what do you see when you go on down to verse 16 of the psalm? Don't you see the testimony that the Lord is known by his justice? He's known by his justice. I think I've said enough, haven't I, to convince you that the theme of the psalm is praise the Lord for his justice. And I hope that you will be inspired to praise the Lord more often for this aspect of his rule and of his character. How wonderful it is, isn't it? How wonderful it is to know that the one who is on the throne of the universe is the one who rules with justice and righteousness. And especially as you and I live in a world where there's a lot of injustice and where we ourselves can sometimes fall victim to it. Maybe you're even experiencing some form of injustice in these days. How good it is to be assured that the Lord has set a day. He has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, the man, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You see, uh, even as children, isn't it one of our longest, one of our strongest longings 
to be treated fairly. Think of how passionately you may have said of things. That's not fair. That's not fair. It's unfair. And there are, indeed, there are, yes, indeed, many times in this fallen world where you will not be treated fairly or justly. How good it is then to be able to look to the Lord as the one who is the lover and the doer of perfect justice. And one day, he will right all wrongs and ensure that justice is fully done. Let's look a little more closely now at the contents of this ninth psalm. I want you to think about four things that are found in this inspired song. Four things. The first one is this. Turn to verses 1 and 2. Consider how the Lord's justice is the focus for wholehearted praise. It's the focus for wholehearted praise. In the light of what David is going to say in the rest of the psalm, it is so fitting for him to begin with praise. And you can see that this, this praise is expressed in four different ways in the opening verses. Four different ways. See how it is wholehearted praise. Wholehearted praise. There's nothing half-hearted about it. For David can declare in the opening line, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. With all my heart. May that be the kind of praise that you and I give to the Lord this day and continually. And then again, this is a praise that tells of the Lord's wonderful deeds or his wonderful actions. Do you see how David resolves to tell of all God's wonders? Now some preachers misinterpret this statement. They think it refers to David speaking to people in the royal court or in the street about what the Lord has done for him. Now that of course would have been a good thing for David to have done. That's a good thing for you and I to be doing. But in the context here, the telling refers to telling as he sings praise. As he sing pra sings praise, David will tell of, he will recount the great things the Lord has done for him in giving him victory over his enemies. You see, true praise consists in adoring God for who he is, but also telling, telling forth, speaking forth what he has done. And that's a good pattern for us to follow in our worship. Let us be adoring God for who he is, and let's be telling forth the wonders he has done, especially, of course, especially, of course, the wonder of salvation that he has provided for unworthy sinners such as we are through the person and work of Jesus Christ, the Saviour. And then also note how David's praise is marked by rejoicing in the Lord. See how he declares in the second verse, I will be glad and rejoice in you. And many of the Psalms are marked by an exuberant joy in the Lord. And I hope that is not missing from your praise. And then notice fourthly that David's praise is expressed in singing. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Yes, true praise comes from the heart, must be inward, but it must also be expressed outwardly with our mouths, with our lips. Remember what Hebrews 13 verse 5 tells us to do. This is what it says. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. The fruit of lips that confess his name. Perhaps you might be a bit reticent to join in the singing of praise because you feel that you cannot do it tunefully. But while we should endeavour, of course, to sing as tunefully as we possibly can, and admittedly, admittedly some of us are numbered among the crows, let's not allow our lack of musical ability to hold us back from singing praise to God Most High. It's a sad thing, it is a sad thing, to come across a congregation of God's people where only a minority are joining 
in the singing of praise, and majority are keeping their mouths closed. That ought not to be. In fact, if you look down to verse 11 of the psalm, you'll see that David moves on from his personal singing of praise to the Lord to calling upon others to join in singing praise to the one who is enthroned, to join in proclaiming among the nations what the Lord has done. So you see then the first main thing we have in this psalm is David praising God wholeheartedly, praising God for his wonderful deeds, praising God joyfully, expressing that praise in the form of singing, exhorting others to join with him in the singing of this praise, praising the Lord for his justice. So the main focus of the psalm is on the Lord's justice. And he's to be praised for that. But let's consider the next section of the psalm for another aspect of this. Look at verses 3 to 6, and later on in verses 15 to 17. Verses 3 to 6 and verses 15 and 7 to 17. We have the Lord's justice guarantees the downfall of his enemies. Guarantees the downfall the judgment of his enemies. This is an aspect of the Lord's justice that might not appeal to many people. But it must not be overlooked and it is very strongly emphasised here in the psalm. Let me draw your attention to two ways in which the psalm highlights the Lord's judgment upon his enemies and upon the enemies of his servant David. In the first place, see how total this judgment is, how total the judgment is, how comprehensive it is, how the Lord brings about the total downfall of his enemies. Verse 3 says that such enemies perish before the Lord. Verses 5 and 6 speak of them being destroyed, being blotted out forever and ever, and experiencing endless ruin. And the solemn truth of the gospel is this. But those who can continue in their opposition to God, who never make their peace with him, that they will be justly subjected to everlasting punishment. And dear friend, today I must warn you, if you are still not at peace with God, if you have still not repented of your sins and obtained forgiveness by placing your trust in Jesus Christ, I must warn you that you are in danger of such a terrible destiny. Don't ever think that the totally just God can simply turn a blind eye to your sin. He can't do that because he's a just God. And therefore you need to have your sins forgiven. You need to trust in Jesus Christ, whom the gospel declares died the just for the unjust to bring you to God. May the solemn truths expressed in the psalm concerning the perishing, the blotting out, and the endless ruin that God will impose upon his enemies. May these spur you on. May these spur you on, dear friend, to make your peace with God this very day. We also see here that one of the reasons why God brings about the downfall of the nations is because they have forgotten him. They've forgotten him. Look on down as far as verse 17. Verse 17. There you can see the solemn statement, the wicked return to the grave, all the nations that forget God. All the nations that forget God. Might that not be a, an accurate description of our own nation in these days? That our nation has by and large forgotten God. How often do you hear the name of God being mentioned in our parliament? How often do you hear God being referred to in a reverent manner on our television screens? Yes, his name is so often taken in vain, but how seldom he is acknowledged as Lord and King. Even in the midst of this terrible virus pandemic, how little reference there is to God and the need for us to turn to him for mercy and for help. It's hard to deny the fact that our nation has forgotten God. 
And to do that, as the psalm shows us, is no small matter. It's no trivial issue. It's a matter of the utmost seriousness. And here, dear friends, dear believers, here's a reminder to you and to me, we who do remember God, I trust, we who do have him in our thoughts, we who do have him, I trust, in the centre of our lives, here's a reminder to you and to me to keep on praying for our nation, to keep on proclaiming the name of the Lord to people who need to be reminded of his existence, to people who need to be reminded of his rule, to people who need to be reminded of his love, to people who need to be reminded of his justice. So the psalm proclaims most forcibly that the Lord's justice guarantees the ultimate downfall, downfall of all his enemies and reminds you and reminds me of how blessed the thing it is, how blessed the thing it is to be reconciled to God through the death of his son. Moving on now to consider the third aspect of God's justice that we find in this ninth psalm. The Lord's justice guarantees the security of his people. It guarantees the security of his people. Let me show you two ways in which this is expressed in the wording of the psalm. First of all, do you see how it's declared in verse 9? And these are wonderful words. See how it's declared in verse 9 that the Lord is the refuge or stronghold of his oppressed people the refuge and stronghold of his people now let's not misunderstand this of course it's important to grasp that the lord does not always grant his people immunity from oppression far from it don't we see over and over again in the pages of scripture that god's people can be subjected for a time at least to terrible oppression God's people Israel were oppressed for many generations during their time of slavery in Egypt before the Lord delivered them. His servant David speaks over and over again of the trouble that he had to endure from his enemies. Look, for instance, even at the 13th verse of the psalm, where David exclaims, O Lord, see how my enemies persecute me. And supremely, of course, supremely. Didn't our Lord Jesus suffer so much oppression, unjust oppression, from the hands of his enemies, culminating in them putting him to death on that cruel cross? And in our own day and generation, and in our own day and generation, isn't there so much oppression being suffered by the people of God in so many nations of our world? So let's not think that the psalm is telling us that we'll never suffer oppression in some form or another. We are not immune from it. Maybe in fact, you're having to put up with some kind of oppression at this very time. That's not easy to put up with. But while the psalm does not at all, does not by any means guarantee us immunity from oppression, it does point us to the Lord, doesn't it? as the one upon whom we can depend for strength and security when faced with such oppression. The one whom verse 9 declares is the stronghold, the, the mighty citadel, the fortress of his people. Please take this to heart. That whatever oppression you may be suffering, and it's not pleasant and it's not easy. Whatever oppression you may be suffering, be assured that the Lord can be your stronghold and your refuge in these days of trouble. Don't ever be tempted to think, I'm on my own in this. I'm, I'm in this all on my own. That's what Satan wants you to think. Rather, keep on looking to the Lord with the eyes of faith. You will find him to be your stronghold and your refuge. In his justice, the Lord will provide you with that security which he alone can give. So that's the first aspect of the security that arises from having a just God. And the second and related aspect of it is this, that we can therefore call upon him for support and deliverance in the midst of oppression. We can call upon him. 
with confidence. See how emphatically David expresses his confidence in this psalm. In verse 10, verse 10 he can say, For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. That's an amazing statement, isn't it? Never forsaken. A God of justice would never unjustly forsake those who truly seek after him. And then again, verse 12, David can say that the Lord does not ignore the cry of the afflicted. This could be more accurately translated as the Lord does not forget the cry of the afflicted. But the same Hebrew word is used in verse 18, where David says that the needy will not always be forgotten. And how good it is to know that, isn't it? How good it is to know that. Don't you find that we as human beings, we can remember for a week or two, perhaps, those who need our help, but then we can lose sight, we can become forgetful, they can fade from our minds, but not so with the Lord. Yes, it may feel at times that the Lord has forgotten us, and that's not a pleasant experience. But the psalm assures us he does not forget the cry of the afflicted. We may always entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. Nations do indeed forget God, but God never forgets his people. Listen to the assuring words of Hebrews 6 and verse 10. Hebrews 6 and verse 10. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. So three things so far. The psalm has shown us that the Lord's ju justice is to be the focus for wholehearted praise. That the Lord's justice guarantees the ultimate downfall of his enemies. That the Lord's justice guarantees the ultimate security of his people. Now, fourthly and lastly, let's see that the Lord's justice is the focus for the prayers of his people. It's the focus for the prayers of his people. In other words, his justice should not only energize our praise, it should also help our, our prayers. Notice the four petitions with which the psalm concludes in verses 19 and 20. Last two verses. And these are that the Lord and his justice might arise to judge the judge so that wicked men would not triumph. That the Lord would judge the nations. That the Lord would even strike terror into the nations. And that he might cause them to know that they are but men. Don't have time to really look at all of these in detail, but just focus on the last one for a moment. That the Lord might cause the nations to know that they are but men. The Hebrew word used here for man and for men is the one that emphasizes human frailty and mortality. It counteracts that human tendency to think of ourselves far more highly than we ought to think of ourselves. In the context, this can be seen in the tendency of nations to forget God, to think that they can manage without him. That human tendency to think ourselves self-sufficient. We should indeed be praying, dear friends, that this virus pandemic, in the, in the face of which we are still so helpless, might lead the rulers of our nation and many others in our nation to know that they are but men and that they need to turn to the Lord for help and for salvation. And now as we conclude, let me ask you to respond to the message of the psalm by doing the following things. The psalm calls upon us to do the following things. Here are practical responses you should make to the message of God's word. First of all, be all the keener to praise the Lord for his justice. Don't overlook this praiseworthy aspect of God's character when you come to worship him. For the believer, the justice of God is not something to be dreaded. It is to be delighted in. So praise him, won't you? Won't you praise him more and more for his justice? And then secondly, 
shouldn't the Psalms spur us on to pray more and more for those whom we know who are still the enemies of God? Psalm has reminded you, hasn't it? It's reminded you so clearly that the enemies of God will be subjected to his just judgment and will suffer a terrible downfall. So won't you think, won't you think more and more of those around about you who do not remember God? Won't you pray more and more that they might look to Jesus and thereby be rescued from the coming wrath of the just and righteous God? The third thing you should do is this. Appreciate afresh that the Lord is your refuge and your stronghold. Whatever oppression you may be experiencing, it may be very, very hard to bear. May the psalm assure you that you can turn for help and strength to the one who is just and righteous. The one who will never forsake those who seek him. And then also, fourthly, won't you keep on interceding for fellow, fellow believers in various parts of the world who are suffering injustice, who are being even persecuted this very day for the sake of righteousness? Remember how the psalm tells us that the Lord has established his throne for judgment. He has established his throne for judgment way back in verse 7. We can therefore intercede for the Lord's suffering people before his throne of grace and justice. The psalm does assure us that the needy will not always be forgotten. Keep on interceding for your fellow believers, your brothers and sisters who suffer such injustice in our day. And fifthly and lastly, aren't we commanded to pray for our nation and for those in authority over us? So pray specifically that our leaders may realise that they are but men. That they are accountable to the Lord of justice and that they need to turn to him for wisdom and for direction and for forgiveness. As the psalm concludes with the words of verse 20, so this message from God's word concludes with the prayer. O Lord, let the nations know that they are but men. O Lord, let the nations know that they are but men. Amen. We're joining together now in singing praise from the words of this psalm. May especially note with joy as we sing it, the Lord is the stronghold of his people in times of trouble. Psalm number nine, let's join together in singing praise to the God of justice.
us now conclude in prayer. Lord God, it does vex us and trouble us that our nation is so forgetful of you, that our nation disregards your will, that our nation is passing laws that are contrary to your word. Lord, it does grieve us and vex us. We pray that even as we have been thinking about this psalm today, it may spur us on more and more to pray for you, O Lord, to look down in mercy upon our land and cause the leaders of our nation in particular to turn to you and to remember you and to remember that they are but men and need you for help and for salvation. And Lord, help each one of us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought, not to be filled with any sense of pride or self-sufficiency, but to acknowledge that we are but frail men and frail, frail women who need to depend upon you each day. And we praise you, O gracious God, that you are indeed the stronghold for your people in times of trouble. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.